And Ms. Brown Philpot, thank you. Oh. Thank you. Um, Ms. Brown Philpot, thank you so much for coming. I'm very excited to have you. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Where did you grow up? First, you can call me Stacy. Okay. <laughs> Second, it's so nice to see you all here. I was telling um, a friend here why I did say yes to this, and um, uh, her dad reached out to me and said, "Hey, when she does these workshops, you should come." And I, you know, it's hard to figure out where to spend my time because Saturdays use with my kids. I have two little girls who are six and three, and they may roll in here. We woke up late this morning, but they may roll in here at some point during this session. Um, but your follow-up with all the details of why you want to do this and your passionate commitment was why I said yes. So thank, thank you, you so for much. having me here. Um, so I'm from Detroit. I grew up um, on the west side city of Detroit. Um, my mom was a single mom. She didn't have a lot of resources to help take care of me and my brother. Um, and we had to sacrifice a lot. Um, but I spent my life there and focused on education. If you can't get anything, you can get an education. It's something that is given to everyone equally. And so she would stay up at night and help us with our homework. And we used typewriters back then and not computers. We didn't have a computer. Um, so we had to correct things and papers. Um, but she did it. And so I went to college at Penn, and that's when I left the city of Detroit. And can you tell us about what TaskRabbit does and how you got the role of CEO? Yeah. So I never wanted to be a CEO. Who wants to be a CEO? <laughs> You do? There you go. I just one person. That's good. Um, I never wanted to be a CEO, and not because I don't love my job, but I just always felt like I was going to be somebody who did great things for people. Um, as I progressed in my career, I found that I liked managing people, leading people, and specifically helping them achieve things in themselves that they couldn't otherwise achieve or they didn't see the potential in doing. Some people did that for me and I felt like I need to give that back and do that for other people. So I spent nine years at Google um, working in a lot of different functions, finance, operations. I actually went to live in India, in Hyderabad, India for a whole Whoa. year um, and ran a huge team over there. And I, you know, I've never thought about going to companies because of what the company does like the, the function of what they do, it's more about the mission and the purpose. So as I graduated from Penn, I went to college, and I graduated from college and went to business school at Stanford. I was out here and I met a classmate of mine who was at Google, and more importantly, I fell in love with the people and the mission of what Google was about. Um, their mission is to organize the world's information. I interviewed with 13 people on one day and just felt like these are some of the best people I've ever interacted with. And so I joined. I spent nine years there, and then I decided that maybe it was time for me to do something different. And I wasn't going to go and just work anywhere. I needed to be somewhere where it was a strong mission, um, a mission-minded person. Um, and so TaskRabbit came along. I met the founder of TaskRabbit, who was another woman who founded the company in Boston um, at Pete's Coffee right here in Tom Country Village. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, I, I try every service. Uh, my daughter, uh, Emma, was five months old at the time. And I said, oh, it's this app you can download to get people to do stuff for you. Um, so I just used the app and said, all right, you know, go to Target. And I was learning how to be a mom, and I couldn't get out the house. I was afraid to leave the house um, at five months old with the baby. And so I was just sort of sitting there, and I said, oh, maybe I can send somebody to Target for me. And I sent this person to Target. The tasker showed up with the stuff, and I thought it was amazing. So I went and had coffee with the founder. Uh, so I, I had coffee with her, and then 18 months later, she uh, was looking for a COO, a chief operating officer, and I reconnected with her, and she said, look, here's where we are with the business. Here's where we're trying to go. Um, our mission is to revolutionize everyday work, and that meant something to me because I grew up in Detroit and watched the auto industry create a lot of middle-class families that were very successful and then ultimately decimate an entire community because the industry declined and I saw lots of hardworking people who couldn't find jobs, who couldn't find a place to work, and here's this app that you can download and here's people who can find work. So I fell in love with her, I fell in love with the mission, and so I left Google to join as COO. Uh, four years into that, Leah decided that she wanted to move on and do something else. She became chairman of the company. And I became the CEO in uh, April 2016, so I've been CEO almost two years. And I didn't ask for that job. I didn't join the CEO to become the CEO one day. I just wanted to build a great business. 
and that's what we did. And what do you do now as CEO of TaskRabbit? So we sold the company to IKEA. I'm sure you all have heard of IKEA. Thank you. Uh, last fall, uh, we decided so we went through a process and we had a partnership with them. Um, they, you know, the partnership just kept growing and growing, and then ultimately we decided we wanted to do more together. And you know, one of the things people often ask, why would you sell a company after you sort of running it for a while? And it really was because their values, the culture, really aligned with ours. And most people. Uh, love Ikea but don't love putting the furniture together and so we already had a lot of people using TaskRabbit to put together their Ikea furniture and we felt like it was a great way to forge a new relationship so we sold the company I still run TaskRabbit as an independent entity within Ikea um, I spend most of my time thinking about the strategy um, do we have the right people are we executing as fast as we can um, do we have enough resources and money um, tools to get the things done that we need to get done. Um, we're also rolling out our services in their stores worldwide. IKEA is the world's largest furniture retailer. They have 344 stores across the world. And so we're embarking on an effort to roll out all of um, our uh, TaskRabbit assembly services to all their stores worldwide. They also have like really good cinnamon buns. They do. <laughs> they do. Part of Which the I didn't realize people like so much. Um, because I like the meatballs, personally. <laughs> yeah, so someone back there is like, yay for the meatballs, um, which is great. Um, but, this, but everyone else who works at Task Fabric likes the cinnamon. That's the, the best cinnamon. part. Yeah. Um, they have a huge food business, like billions of dollars. Really? Yes. So lots of people eat at Ikea. That's the bottom line. <laughs> and so only 36% of entrepreneurs are women. So what is it like for you to work in such a male-dominated field? You know, it's not, unfortunately, it's normal. Um, I, before I came to Silicon Valley, I worked on Wall Street, where I don't know what the percentage are who are women, but it's probably 36%, some low number, at least at that time, that was in 1999, 2000. So I was used to being the only woman at something. Um, I'm also African American, and it's not that there's one, two, I think I see three, African-American women, young girls included. I got to include all of us in this room. Four, here we go, wait, there's one more. Four, there we go, there we go. Um, and so I'm used to walking into a room being the only or one of the only ever since. My high school was 98% black. And then when I went to Penn, it was 6%. And it, it just stayed that way. It never, I never, I've never been anywhere since I left Detroit in high school where I was around mostly black people. So I got used to being the only or one of the only. So the concept of being in Silicon Valley and being one of few entrepreneurs, you just learn how to be who you are. It took me a while. I hope it doesn't take you all that long. It took me a really long time to figure out that the only person I can be is me and people just have to accept me for who I am. But once I got there, it was okay. Um, I try to do talks like this. I try to talk to people about what they can become so that these things aren't normal, so that I don't feel like the norm is to be the only one in the room. So I need all of you to become CEOs so <laughs> that, these, that this is not the norm, that the norm becomes majority women. I tell my girls that girls will rule the world someday, so you guys gotta help me in that effort. Yeah, <laughs> what, is there any like particular advice you give your daughters? on how to rule the world, because that's on my agenda. Is that on your agenda? <laughs> I love that that is on your agenda. That's awesome. Yeah, you guys. Uh, so this week, we um, celebrated Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, birthday on Monday. And um, on Thursday, I read in my daughter's class. And so I tried to find a book that was relevant for first graders, because she's in the first grade, but also tied to his mission and his legacy. And um, we read a story about Ruby Bridges. Do you guys know who Ruby Bridges is? First African-American girl to go to a desegregated school in the South. And so Ruby um, was in the sixth grade, and she was, I'm sorry, she was in the first grade, she was six years old, so the same age as my daughter. Um, and she was doing something that was courageous. She was doing something that was brave. She was doing something that was right. Dr. King said it's always the right time to do the right thing. And that's important. 
So if you want to rule the world, you got to do what's courageous, do what's brave, and do what's right. Even if the world around you thinks it's the wrong thing, if you know it's the right thing, it's always the right time to do the right thing. That's what I tell them. Wow. <clears throat> wow. That's really good advice. <laughs> and so then going back to the limited number of women, you're also a board member. You're on the board of HP and Nordstrom's. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of women are board members. Um, what, do you, what do you do as a board member? Yeah, so the, the CEO job, you're hands-on every day. You're like, I get up in the morning, I pick three things that I'm going to focus on. I get to work, I know there's going to be ten other things that interrupt those three things, but you check a lot of things off the to-do list. When you're a board member, you don't get to do anything. You just go to a meeting for two days, and someone else has to execute, but you get to talk to them about what are the things that you can help them with. They ask for advice. Um, part of being on a board is there's a strategy. So on the board of HP, let's take Nordstrom, because... You know, I think people like to shop. Who likes to shop in here? You do? Okay. Who shopped at Nordstrom? Yeah, good. That's a awesome. little bit too much. A little bit too much. That's good. I like As a board member, I like that. Um, <laughs> um, but what, you know, we go to the Nordstrom board meeting, we have a strategy session, and we talk about the changing landscape of retail, which is a lot of people are buying things online. They're not going to the store anymore. What can we do to, one, take advantage of this asset that we have, which is this building, um, and two, figure out how to not be disrupted by Amazon or any other company. And so as someone who um, built a company that exists because the technology exists, I, I, I'm not in a non-tech industry. So I can sit in the room and just talk about how our entire business is online mm -hmm. until the person shows up at the door. And most of our business is mobile. We're not thinking about how do we, how do we go from 10 to 20%. We are a majority of mobile business today. So I can bring that perspective to an organization that's been around for 75 years that is very good at selling clothes that you all buy, but hasn't thought yet about how do we transform what we're doing to become a mobile business. So I get to give my advice. I take my expertise from what I do every day at TaskRabbit and share it with another company, another industry. It's fun. Sounds like fun. Um, what role has confidence played in your success? Yeah, positives and negatives. Um, yeah, there's been times when I haven't had confidence, um, where I remember being in banking and um, I was an analyst, which is like the lowest person in the company. And I remember going to this meeting and there was this woman who was very senior in the company. And she said, you know, Stacy, whatever you do, don't get the coffee. And I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, when we go to this meeting, don't get the coffee. Now, I've been up since until 3 a.m., and I was tired. I wanted some coffee. I wanted some coffee. Um, but I didn't do it, and I didn't know why she said it, but after it was clear that she wanted me to sit at the table and have the confidence to present, and if I had gotten the coffee, the people would have treated me as like, oh, she's just the junior analyst person. So I was terrified. It was my first time presenting to all these really important people, and I don't think I had the confidence to say it, but her saying to me, like, sit here, do your part, don't get the coffee, you know, really helped me. Um, over time, like, I've built confidence, mostly because I've made a lot of mistakes, and you figure out that, like, the mistakes are the way that you learn. Um, so now, when I was negotiating a deal for IKEA to sell the company, like, I was pretty confident that I wanted to do what was right for the team. And I had the support of my board, and I had the support of the company to make sure that we were taken care of. And then just looking back after all the experience you've gained, what's some advice you have for middle school girls? Yeah, so middle school was the hardest time in my life. That was um, the time when I wasn't like the popular kid, I wasn't the rich kid, I wasn't the like kid that people wanted to hang out with, and I wasn't the social kid. Like I was. It was hard for me to start conversations with people, so I, I had a hard time like making friends. I had a couple friends, but I was smart. So it was like, I was a smart kid. So I was, I was in the city of Detroit, not popular, not rich, didn't have the best clothes, the best hairstyle, like nothing. I could dance, though. <laughs> I could dance. I could dance. Um, but I was a smart kid, and so I got teased a lot for being too smart. Um, 
hopefully you guys don't have it because you live here in Silicon Valley and everyone's smart. So um, I got teased a lot for not having certain things. And so I never knew in fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade that like what I was doing was the right thing and that it was going to be okay. So it's going to be okay. Whatever your quirkiness is, whatever thing you have about you that people don't like and you're unsure, like once you get to high school, you're like, oh my God, it's going to be so much better. It may not be. And that's okay to not peak in high school. No. Nope. Totally okay. Um, and it's going to be fine. You're going to be fine. Your friends are going to be fine. And keep the people around you who really care about you and respect you for who you are as a person. That's what I would say. Um, does anyone have questions that they would like to ask Stacy? Yeah. What is the hardest um, thing about being a woman on entrepreneur? Um, <clears throat> the hardest thing about being a woman entrepreneur is there's a there's like being the entrepreneur and being the woman, and I have two kids at home and every day I think about like what's the trade-off between how much time I'm going to spend with them and how much time I'm going to spend at work and I think all people make that trade-off men and women but as a woman it's it's not it's, it's harder because there's a lot of women in our society today who thinks I should always prioritize my kids and I think I love what I do I tell my kids every morning, I'm going to work. I love what I do. I hope you find your passion and you love what you do someday. And sometimes they cry, like my three-year-old, she cries because she wants mommy to stay at home. But then she sees me at work and she's like, can I go to work with you? We have bunnies on like bring your kids to work day. So she always <laughs> thinks we have bunnies every day at work, but we don't. So, you know, it's, it's that balance that we have to strike. And, you know, there's an extra um, cost to being an ambassador for other women and you know an advocate for other women and a supporter of other women I'm not afraid of it I still do it but it's extra and it's that means we sleep a little less but I think women we're girls we're stronger so we can handle it <laughs> right yeah go back here and then I'll come back go ahead so my dad is reading To retrain them? No, to betray. How to betray. Yeah. How to betray them. Now, so I don't know what he did to betray his closest friends and coworkers, but I've had to do, I've had to have some difficult conversations as a CEO. Um, and even before you become a CEO, any leader will go through a phase where you build really strong relationships with people who are really good at what they do right now. But then the business changes. You grow, you're, tw you're twice the size of what you are, and that person isn't the right person for the job anymore. And no matter how deeply you care about them, no matter how close you're, you're, you are with them, your family, your friends you hang out, they just aren't the right person to do the job. And I've had to have some difficult conversations with people who are close to me because I wanted to take care of the relationship but then let them go. And that's hard. That's really hard. I wouldn't call it a betrayal, but it's definitely hard. Yeah. What was the first job you ever had? Paper route. <laughs> um, my brother and I, he's uh, almost two years older than me, we started a paper route. And so I was the person who counted the money and made sure we got paid. And, you know, unfortunately there was no Venmo or no PayPal. Mm -hmm. So when you go and deliver the papers and you knock on the door and the person doesn't have the weekly money, they don't answer the door sometimes, or they like pretend they're not at home. So I was like the collector to make sure we got the money because we only got paid if we paid the pay for the papers. And so if someone didn't pay, like that cut into our profits. So I was like the finance person on paper. And like actual physical newspapers. Actual physical newspapers. <laughs> yes, thank you. To be clear, we were going door to door and delivering actual physical newspapers to people's houses, which is totally, that's, that's a boring concept today. Any questions? OK. 
Hey, um, would you like to explain the activity? Should we yes, so I'm going to put some slides up and just walk us through the activity, but um, we're going to do two things. The first thing we're going to do is create a tasker profile, um, and I'll talk about what a tasker is. And then the second thing we're going to do is you guys are going to help me with a new program that we are launching at TaskRabbit. Okay? All right. So TaskRabbit, if you haven't used it before or someone in your family hasn't used it before, you can download our app and hire people to do things for you around your house. Put together your IKEA furniture, mount a TV on a wall, and the people who provide those services are taskers. So we have 60,000 taskers in our community. Um, we operate the service in 40 different cities across the country. We also operate the service in the UK. And so every 15,000 people go to our site every month to re request to become a tasker. And it's not everybody gets in because they don't have the right set of skills, they don't present themselves very well. So one of the things we try to do is when someone becomes a tasker is we encourage them to create a great profile. So what you guys get to do today is create your own tasker profile and take your own picture and tell people what you can do and how much you charge. And you can take it home if you want and like now you can market yourself to do things and maybe somebody will hire you. But because, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview of what this looks like on the app and then we have some like Polaroid cameras and some construction paper to do it. So this is a sample profile. I haven't done 50 tasks, but I've done a lot of tasks and I'm happy to talk after about like the tasks I've done. But you'll see somebody who has, you know, their rating, how many tasks they've done, um, this is where they work, obviously not New York City. I do mostly, I do some cleaning jobs um, and this my hourly rate is $44 an hour. So if you were to sign up for and select me, you, you can hire me. To get there, you, the taskers sign in, they put their name, some information, they start the registration process, and they upload a picture, and they tell us some information about them that will help them get hired. And so we let them pick from a menu of options. So I'll, I'll put this back up while you're working on your, your project, but um, we let them pick from a menu of options for all the types of things that you can do on TaskRabbit. So some of the more popular things, as we discussed, is furniture assembly. Often people need help moving, mounting some things on a wall. Waiting in line is still an activity that people do. <laughs> so if you, I think there's a lot of famous um, brunch places. Do you need me to sit here? No, you can totally stand. Um, a lot of like famous brunch places in San Francisco that don't take a reservation. So they will hire taskers to wait in line so when they get there, they can just walk in. Um, That's very expensive, though. It's like $40 for the hour. It's like expensive. But you could do that, too. Um, <clears throat> the last thing I got done was a friend of mine. Um, we had an event at our house. He was in town. I hosted a brunch, and I hired a tasker to come help me do the event planning around it. So you can pick what you want to do. Um, but then you've got to show off your skills. So on the left-hand side is you set your skills, expectations. Here's what I do. You pick your hourly rate. How much do you want to, how much is your time worth? So you get to say how much your time is worth. And then your quick pitch. So that's important. So the quick pitch is like the message that the customer will see about you that says like it has to be creative. You want to stand out. You want to look like somebody you want to hire. So you got to take a good picture and you have to have a good quick pitch. So something about your passion, something about your personality. Here's an example. So on the left, that's, that's what not to do. I'm good at fixing things and can mount TVs. Okay, but maybe I wanna hire that person? Probably not. On the right, it's I bring years of experience to every task. I'm, and I'm skilled in difficult things, like mounting things behind walls and routing electrical things in fireplaces, right? He's talking about, this tasker is talking about, and I have a camera, I've got all the tools that I need to do the job and I have everything you need. So I read that description and I feel safe. I'm like, okay, this person's gonna show up ready to do the job and they seem really passionate because they're skilled, they can do hard stuff, they can go behind walls and they've got all the tools. So that's, that's an example of a good pitch that you wanna write about yourself. And the finished profile looks like this. So Christopher there, he's got, you know, he's an elite tasker and a licensed pro. So a licensed pro means he's probably has a licensed, elect, he's a licensed electrician, so he can do more complicated electrical work. So if you have any certifications, you can write that on your profile. He's also an elite tasker, which means that he's done 
Um, it's a badging that we give to taskers every month who do really good high quality work that's measured by their response time, their performance, and the ratings that they get after they complete the task. Uh, so the last point I'll say here is that we also do background checks. I think it's safe to say that you all have been successfully background checked, <laughs> but um, if you were signing up for real, you'd go through a background check, and it's a screening process just to make sure that people don't sign up for the marketplace who have a, a criminal background and might present an unsafe situation for a client. So that's it on the task for profile. So you're gonna get some break up into some groups, present, um, take a picture of yourself, and write your quick pitch. Set an hourly rate, write your quick pitch. Got it? And then you'll get a chance to present back to us. I don't know if we'll have time to do it. I'm gonna do the second one. We don't have time, I don't know if we'll have time to do it. The second one is about TaskRabbit for good. So I talked a whole lot about being mission-minded and certainly we create a lot of jobs in our marketplace because people love to use uh, TaskRabbit and people find work. We have, the average hourly rate is $35 an hour and people pay bills by, by earning money on TaskRabbit. We launched last year an initiative to expand what we do to allow our taskers to volunteer with nonprofit organizations in their communities that really are focused on um, homelessness and ending um, and helping to create jobs. So this is our community initiative and we built a strategy around it and what I'll do is um, show this page which is <clears throat> we really want the community to feel like TaskRab is not just there to help people earn money and also for people like me to get things done around my house but the community residents, which you see at the bottom here, really see TaskRabbit as a place where we're giving back and investing in that community. And so one of the things we're trying to do is think about how do we be neighbors helping neighbors? And in particular, what are the kinds of things that we can do in communities that help reinvest in those communities and help those communities grow? And the concept of neighbors helping neighbors is how TaskRabbit was founded. So Leah was at home in Boston, about to go out to dinner with her husband, and needed somebody to feed the dog because she forgot. And she said, what if I could find somebody in my neighborhood to come and feed the dog? Well, we want to take the concept of neighbor helping neighbors beyond that and not just paying for, for it, but also providing services to people who wouldn't otherwise be able to get them. So in three pillars, we want to invest in the diversity of our community. Um, bring in everybody who's interested in finding work. We want to help build sustainable livelihoods, so we want to help create a community where people are reinvesting their resources in the community and uh, growing those communities. And we want to create a way where everybody can have a livable wage. We want all people to live above the poverty line someday, and we want them to have a meaningful income. And so TaskRabbit for Good, here's an example of us volunteering at um, a homeless shelter in New York. We went down to Houston uh, after the hurricanes to help support some of the efforts down there and work with one of the food bank and we're operating in eight different cities. So I would love for you to spend some time coming up with ideas on different ways that we can be better neighbors helping neighbors and investing in the community and then we can take some of these projects and make them task Rabbit for good projects. That's it. Any questions? Who wants to volunteer to present their profile? Here we go. Right here. You want to go second? Okay. So I he he think I should be a dog feeder so people don't have to feed their dogs. It's kind of not fair that that some people get. To or have someone feed their dog and some people don't. Very good. So how much do you charge for feeding dogs? Um, 
with people who want to learn. Um, I'm an experienced dancer, and my most important thing is to learn and also to have fun. And um, I would mostly teach my style, because <laughs> that's what I know. Um, it's a Latin ballroom, if you guys don't know what that is. And um, I would just teach easy moves, or if you're more experienced, I would teach you. And I don't know what my hourly rate would be. I feel like it would just depend on the person. But I feel it could be maybe like $50 an hour. So, yeah, that is my Hi, my name is Anya, and I'm 10 years old. And I will um, help the homeless. And, like, when I'm at events, sometimes there's, like, lots of leftovers. And I wonder what to do with the leftovers, so instead of throwing the leftovers like out, I would um, give them to the homeless. And then I feel like the homeless too. So, yeah. Very good. Um, my name is Maya and my task of skills is like custom decorations and gifts for parties and stuff. And so I have 11 years of, of experience with this. <laughs> Um, and my thing is, I want to make sure that any party anyone has is very special because when it, there's a party, it's about you. And if things are more custom, then it's more special, I guess. And my hourly rate would be $27, um, $27 an hour. I had a little thing for a task for a good. Every month, I would... so. People in need often get gifts like food or toys and stuff, but I thought it would be fun for them to get something custom made that is about them, so every month I'd send out some for those in need and a little custom card to go with it. Very good. Hi, my name is Isla and I'm nine years old and I was thinking we could do like bake sales and stuff or science fairs to help um, animal shelters. Um, yeah. How much do you charge? Uh, $15. $15. <laughs> My name is Ana Sophia, and um, I would uh, help out at parties. So if you need me to wash dishes or um, help with uh, kids, um, parties such as New Year parties and birthday parties. I can also run errands to many different stores such as Safeway, Stanford Mall, and many more. I can also help with packing and shipping boxes, and I can do laundry, and, be, and I like babies and kids. And my hourly rate is $28. All right. My name is Madison. My task is to sing and dance, and I, um, I would like them to pay thirty dollars. Right. My name is Dia and I can take care of babies. I've taken care of my cousins before, so I have some experience in that and my hourly rate is thirty dollars. Alright. 